Good evening, everyone. I'm Katrina Conroy, MLA for Kootenai West, and I'm here live on behalf of my legislative colleagues representing the Interior Health Authority from the Alberta border uh, through the Kootenays, the Okanagan, and the Thompson region right up to Williams Lake, and all those many communities throughout the southern interior. Joining me as well is my colleague, Norm Letnick, the MLA for Kootenai Lake Country. And I just wanna thank Norm for inspiring us all to do this. Uh, this is our fifth joint uh, town hall meeting that we've had with in all of the health authorities throughout the province. We're the last one. I'm, I think we saved the best for last, right, Norm? And I just wanna thank him for inspiring us all to do this. Also with us tonight are our special guests, Susan Brown, the president and CEO of the Interior Health and Dr. Sue Pollack, the Medical Health Officer for the Interior Health Authority. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging all the Indigenous peoples on whose traditional territories that we are all gathered tonight right across the Interior Health Authority region. Just a few minutes ago, I think some of you might actually have been outside cheering on all of our workers who are getting us through this difficult time. And I want to thank all of those who are doing such an amazing job the healthcare heroes, the truckers, the grocery store workers, the utility workers, the early childhood educators, all of you who are making sure that we are safe and, and getting the essential services that we need. We understand how difficult this has been, but what we were doing is working. And I wanna thank you, those of you at home tonight for the sacrifices that you've made so far so we can get through this together and flatten that curve. I know as I see it when I'm out there getting our supplies for at home here that so many of you are respecting the social distancing, whether you're at the grocery stores, at the post office, out for a walk. And we understand that there are a lot of questions. In fact, it's why we're here tonight, to get answers from our experts that are with us. I'm proud of how our government has been able to get people the facts. And I know our province was the first in Canada to provide daily updates. and. I know many of us tune in to see what's up with Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. This virtual town hall is, is another way to help British Columbians bring questions to the people who have been leading the COVID-19 efforts right across the province in each of our regions. I'm now gonna hand this over to my co-host, MLA Norm Letnick, to give us a quick overview of what this town hall will look like. Well, thank you, MLA Katrine Conroy, and I'm gonna call you Katrine for the rest of the night, if that's okay. And and thank you everyone for joining. I want to echo uh, Katrine's uh, thoughts on how proud we are of everyone in British Columbia to help uh, flatten the curve in, in BC. We wouldn't be right now uh, looking at options to reopen the economy if we would not have uh, pulled together to make sure that we have flattened the curve. So congratulations to everyone in Interior Health for doing a great job. Um, you know, personally, of course, I uh, need to thank our frontline health workers, uh, other essential workers, uh, those impacted in any way, uh, whether through uh, lost loved ones, uh, condolences to all of you, um, to people who have been infected by COVID, those uh, under restrictions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, everybody who has uh, been impacted by the delaying of surgeries or cancellation of surgeries, obviously that impacts you and your families uh, quite extensively. And I wanna say thank you for, for taking that on for, for the rest of us. Uh, and the businesses, we have a lot of businesses. Private sector is hurting really badly right now because of this. And uh, my heart, uh, our hearts go out uh, to, uh, to all the businesses out there and employees, uh, owners, entrepreneurs that are struggling right now because of this pandemic. We, were, we are all thinking of you and looking for ways uh, that we can open up the economy again. I'm proud of all my colleagues and all parties. Uh, our health authority leadership have collaborated to ensure that British Columbians get important opportunities to have their questions answered. And as uh, Katrina said, uh, we've had several uh, health authorities uh, do this. And uh, this is the second one with IH, uh, with uh, Susan Pollack and, uh, and um, Susan Brown. So thank you to both of them. And maybe we can take a moment uh, for both of you to uh, introduce yourselves to, uh, to our uh, viewing audience. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And hopefully bring people even further up to date with what's happening uh, in our system. So I'm Susan, I'm the President and CEO of Interior Health and I've been with Interior Health about nine years now. Thanks. Great, and uh, good evening everyone. It's also a pleasure to be here with you, some of you um, for the second time. And I am the Chief Medical Health Officer with Interior Health Authority and I've been here for just over eight years and I'm a public health and preventive medicine um, specialist. 
Uh, thank you to both of you. So this is the way it's going to work. Um, uh, MLA Conroy and I will introduce uh, the questions. We'll take turns reading people's questions that were submitted in advance. Uh, don't worry if you didn't get a chance to uh, submit a question in advance. If you're watching right now on the Government uh, of BC Facebook site, you can submit your questions in the comments section down below. And we'll have a chance to address those after we address the questions that were submitted in advance. So let's get going. Okay, well, let's start with a question that's been on a lot of people's minds. And I understand that this topic was discussed in the previous town halls, but I, I think folks would like us to talk about it further tonight. So with that, here's our first question from Brenda in West Kelowna. Interior health covers a huge portion of our province. I understand the need for patient privacy, but it wouldn't violate the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act to give us an estimate of how many cases are in each community why can't this information be provided? So um, this has been asked a lot in a lot of different settings and we are following the direction of our provincial medical health officer that when there's an outbreak somewhere like a long-term care facility or in a, a group cluster where we need to see people's behavior change, that is uh, something that we declare and make public. However, when it's an individual, uh, some of our communities are small and that privacy is really important. We've seen in other jurisdictions of, in other countries where uh, that has become a problem. And part of the strategy is that we want people to feel really free and open to come forward and be tested. And British Columbia have actually tested more people than many jurisdictions in Canada. And I think that's because people feel comfortable coming forward having their test done and knowing they're going to be a, a good follow-up and they won't be, there would be no stigma, stigma for them coming forward. So I think that's paid off for us and we've tested over 60,000 people in the province to date. Thank you. Um, the second question is another topic of interest in our province's testing strategy. Nancy from Grand Forks asks, can you describe how the ability to test for COVID-19 and contract tracing is being developed. Uh, what are the goals for testing and tracing? Great, thanks for that question. So the uh, provincial testing strategy is something we follow here in Interior Health, and it has uh, it has evolved as we've learned more about this virus and and as this pandemic has progressed. So initially, when we started our testing strategy in the province, we were focusing on travelers who were returning from outside of Canada. We knew that that was a high risk group. We wanted to find those cases, identify them quickly, and isolate them, and find their contacts. And following that, we were focusing um, additionally on some other high priority and high risk and vulnerable groups. Those included healthcare workers, uh, residents, and staff of long-term care, uh, individuals who are likely to be hospitalized, as well as those who are part of, uh, part of outbreaks uh, or clusters. And uh, since that time, we've also included um, individuals living in uh, rural, remote, and indigenous communities, um, as well as those in congregate settings, such as correctional facilities or living in shelters. And just this, uh, just over the last couple of days, um, the provincial testing strategy has evolved again. And uh, now we are recommending testing for anybody who's got um, COVID-like symptoms, um, influenza-like symptoms, or cold symptoms. So that's a whole range of, um, of symptoms from um, more severe cough or shortness of breath, uh, but also including other symptoms like headache, uh, muscle ache, sore throat, runny nose. And uh, we've, we've done that so that we can um, prevent disease transmission and make sure we're not missing any cases in the community. And we will be um, speaking more about that later this evening, I'm sure. In terms of the contact tracing, so when we identify a case of COVID-19 in the community, we, uh, we follow our usual public health principles, which is to, um, we interview that case, our public health team interviews that case. Uh, we learn about uh, where they've been and who they've been in close contact with. And, and then we speak uh, to their contacts as well. And often these are close household contacts, but they could be contacts in other settings that they've had. And uh, we, we may isolate those contacts and we certainly would ask them to self-monitor for symptoms. So this is uh, similarly, uh, this question is, is from Ron and Cranbrook, Cranbrook and, and he'd like to know, are people exposed to COVID actually being tested or just put into quarantine? Mm -hmm. Right. So when we, when we identify the case and, and then we subsequently identify their contacts or those who, who have been exposed uh, to the case, um, we, do, uh, we do ensure that they don't have symptoms. If they have symptoms, those contacts, then we would recommend that they uh, would get testing at this point in time. 
Otherwise, we'd ask them to isolate or to self-monitor for symptoms. And uh, we have another one from uh, Phil from Fruitvale. And uh, I know uh, we are still in the thick of the crisis. Uh, people have concerns about what this might look like uh, as months go by. And Phil says, are we preparing for the fall? And Carrie from Simon Arm would like to know, is there a chance that there could be more cases of the illness than there is now when the next winter comes around? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Both very, uh, very timely and important questions right now. And we are all very carefully watching our et epidemic curve. Um, we talk lots about flattening and bending the curve, which really helps to protect the healthcare system, but also minimize the disease transmission. And so we're watching that curve right now. We are seeing a flattening and a bending, and that is really due to all of the efforts of everybody in, in society, in our communities, who is um, following the advice and the recommendations and the guidance of our, our provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. So we know that with some respiratory viruses, we do see a decrease in, in cases over the summer months. And I'll use influenza as an example. Um, often we see a peak of influenza in the winter, into winter months and then a decline over the summer. We don't yet know if we're going to see that same trend with COVID-19. It's probably a little bit early to know. And I don't think we can count on that. However, we do know that in the fall, we're going to have the reappearance of other respiratory viruses that we're familiar with, um, as well as likely a resurgence, a reappearance of COVID. And so, yes, we are preparing for what is likely to be the second wave of COVID. Thank you. Okay. And as we mentioned, we, we are in the thick of this pandemic and, and I recognize the immense sacrifices that British Columbians have made in, in order to flatten that curve and, and help stop the spread of COVID-19. And we have questions uh, coming in about what's next and if there's a possibility of easing some of the restrictions in place. For example, Jean from Golden, she asks, now that we are several weeks into the COVID pandemic and have learned a lot about the virus and who it affects most adversely, why are we not directing our attention to protecting the most vulnerable rather than shutting down everything? I keep reading that over 95% of the population will show mild or no symptoms. Why must we all stay home? Mm -hmm. So it's been really important um, that we have followed the direction and guidance of public health officials, which has included physical distancing, which is staying two meters or six feet from people, um, staying home, especially if we're ill, and washing our hands. And those are the three things we've heard multiple times from Dr. Bonnie Henry. And uh, we are protecting the most vulnerable by doing those things. Um, and that's uh, one reason why we do those things. And we do know as well that in some cases we do see um, more severe illness in, in younger individuals, um, but you're correct that in about 80% of, of individuals we see quite mild disease. And so um, all of these efforts are, are really paying off and we're seeing that, but we need to continue with these efforts. Um, there has been discussion about uh, what it might look like uh, to lift or ease some of the, some of the restrictive measures. And um, I think we're all watching and waiting for that. But we know when that time comes, it's going to be slow and measured and a very thoughtful approach to doing that. On the other hand, there are folks who would like to know what more can be done to ensure that we all hold the line. Uh, Judy from Penticton asks, it seems as our numbers continue to improve, many people are becoming very casual about the situation. What action is prepared to ensure that we all stay the course? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, from my observation um, over the past couple of months that uh, the majority of people are following the direction and guidance and advice of public health officials. And um, there are a number of uh, public, uh, provincial health officer orders in place, um, such as banning of uh, mass gatherings, um, over 50 people and the closure, as we know, of nightclubs and food establishments and personal service establishments. Um, but there's also a lot of guidance um, and recommendations in terms of things like physical distancing. So we need to continue to do those things. Um, we recognize that that is very, very difficult for people. It's very difficult for all of us to do that. Um, but um, in terms of compliance, I think we're going to continue to rely on uh, the goodwill um, of our, our public and of society to continue to do the right thing and to listen to the advice. Okay, so ensuring social and physical distancing is something that uh, we're all have, have been incredibly mindful of and in this fight against COVID. And, and this is an interesting question from Jonathan from West Kelowna. He says, why social distancing? Logically, two meters makes little difference in the spread of small particle. Virus particles do not respect the two meter distance, nor do they disappear as people walk through the same airspace. COVID-19 can stay airborne for hours. 
would it be more logical and effective to encourage society to frequently wash their hands and clothes every day and allow people to resume life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know uh, we have good evidence of how the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 virus um, is transmitted. And that is through respiratory droplets from the, uh, from the mouth, uh, from the nose, so transmitted through coughing or sneezing or sometimes talking. And we also know those droplets are quite heavy. And so they actually don't, they don't hang around in the air. Um, when they are expelled from a person, they actually can travel. And we know this again from other, influ other respiratory viruses, they can travel as far as about six feet or two meters at the maximum, and then they fall. And they may fall on a surface, they may fall, they may land on somebody else. And um, in those situations, um, not only can they be transmitted through or inhaling the droplets, but also through um, touching contaminated surfaces. So we are very confident in how uh, the COVID-19 virus is, is spread, it's very similar to other viruses um, um, such as influenza. And um, it's, it's, so it is, that measure has, I think, really uh, uh, fared us well in terms of our uh, ability to flatten and bend the curve. Um, but along with that, because of that risk of touching contaminated surfaces and uh, contaminating our hands and then touching our face, um, that measure of hand washing, of course, is something we emphasize and proper hand washing um, that we need to teach ourselves and our kids to do, which is a uh, minimum of 20 seconds. That can be with soap and water, which works perfectly well um, to, to um, kill the virus, but also in some cases, people use hand sanitizer as well. You can uh, sing happy birthday twice, I think. That's about 20 mm -hmm. seconds. We tell the kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jordan and Montrose would like to know, I have uh, seen a lot of people continuing to gather with friends and family in driveways, yards, etc., six feet apart. Is this considered proper social distancing or should people avoid socializing even if it's six feet apart? Yeah, so it's an interesting one because we are really trying to keep that physical distancing boundary. And I see lots of people um, sort of just doing day-to-day -day conversations as they pass other people's driveways and some people on nice days uh, just sitting apart. But um, as Sue said, when somebody coughs or sneezes, that those droplets can uh, be on hard surfaces and other surfaces. So if you are going to do that, it's best to take your own chair with you and not be uh, touching other things that those people have. So uh, not sharing food or drinks or anything like that. So if you're going, it's like you go as your own little compact unit and uh, do your social distance, your physical distancing and uh, make sure that you don't have, if you're taking your kids or not running about between people and touching everything. That's where you, you end up with that cross contamination. So um, it's possible. Uh, you just have to be really aware of your surroundings and what you're doing if you're going to do that. Thank you. Especially good to know now as the weather is getting better for everybody to remember that. So yeah. we, actually, we had a number of questions that came in asking about how we can protect the youngest members of our society, uh, babies, and which is near and dear to my heart. I know it is Norm too, as he just showed us a picture of his, his new grandchild, his new grandson. Um, people would like to know what is the best way to protect a baby in a pandemic? Uh, there's a new grandma from Barb in Kamloops, congratulations Barb, who asks, I'm over 65 and my son and daughter-in-law just had a baby. Is it safe for me and for the baby for me to hold him? So when you've got a newborn, obviously they're vulnerable at the best of times. So um, everybody's um, really clean with their hand hygiene and uh, making sure that uh, when you're dealing with the baby that you're, you've got things as clean as possible, you know, that you've got to sterilize bottles, etc. So for grandparents, not only for, um, if, if you live with your grandparents, obviously that's fine, you're part of the household and they would be part of uh, your group that you're with every day. So that would be okay if you live together in the same household. But unfortunately, if you don't, the answer is no. It's a really hard one. I mean, people are sacrificing so much. Um, you know, the birth of grandchildren, uh, weddings, funerals, um, it is very difficult, but the advice would be not to, especially if you are a senior that's got underlying chronic disease and other things, it's just uh, putting everybody at risk. On the topic of births, Anne from Kelowna has another question. Uh, she says, is it acceptable to travel to other provinces to visit our family members as there are births happening? 
Mm -hmm. Well, we've heard, uh, we've heard quite clearly from public health officials that we should at this time and still should be avoiding non-essential travel. Um, of course, we know that this uh, pandemic is progressing differently um, in different uh, parts of the world, but certainly in different parts of Canada as well. We see um, quite a different uh, epidemic curve in Ontario and Quebec than we see here in BC and different from Alberta again. So that recommendation still stands that people should be avoiding non-essential travel. Of course, it's very difficult with when there's a new baby or family that you want to visit another province. Um, but we are encouraging people to just uh, wait a little bit longer and to find other ways to connect and make those social connections with those family members. Thank you. Thanks. On the same topic of caring for our loved ones, Terry from Kimberly asks, my husband works away. How can I safely take care of my husband if he brings COVID-19 home? Is it possible to care for him and not get the virus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good question. And uh, we certainly in public health, that's something that we do provide uh, guidance and advice around. So if there is a, um, an individual in a household who is a COVID positive individual, uh, we recognize there are other household members likely uh, living with them. And so we, um, once we've uh, spoken with the family, we um, provide advice as to how to safely self-isolate uh, or isolate that individual with COVID in the household. Um, that would include things like staying in their own room, with their own bathroom, um, you know, really having limited or no interaction with other family members. So you might need to bring food to them at the door of their room. Um, and certainly having, having them wear a mask as well um, and in some situations, it can be really hard to do that. It might be a, a like a very small dwelling um, with maybe a large family. Um, so you know, certainly there might be other other options in terms of maybe the, the family members who uh, who aren't affected, especially if they're vulnerable. Um, for example, elderly. Um, looking at maybe there's another another place they can they can stay until their family member gets better. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Joan in Summerland who asks about homemade masks. And I know my wife took out the sewing machine and I have two of them <laughs> ready to go whenever the, we get the green light. Uh, why is the use of homemade masks to pr help prevent transmission of C19 not more aggressively promoted along with infomercials on how to use and take them off properly? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'll speak to masks first. And uh, we recognize that masks, and I'm talking about surgical masks and procedural masks and, and, and N95 respirators um, are a precious commodity for a healthcare system. So we need to first off ensure we're reserving those masks for our healthcare workers. Um, the topic of um, homemade masks or cloth masks um, has, uh, has been a very hot topic, uh, both federally and here provincially. And we've heard a little bit of a change in language in terms of the use of uh, homemade and cloth masks. And uh, we are also seeing um, people who are still open their businesses, having their employees wearing them. And we know there's interest in the public. I think it, it, it maybe helps the public to think they can do something, right? It's something that they can control. Um, so if individuals are, um, are choosing to wear a mask, a homemade or cloth mask, um, <clears throat> There is a more sort of permissive, uh, permissive approach to that now in the province. And it's important to remember that if you're wearing a mask, it's really about um, protecting other people from you. It, it really, there's no evidence to say it, it provides protection for you as you're wearing the mask. Um, <clears throat> we know that when people wear masks, especially those who aren't used to wearing masks, are more likely to fiddle with it and touch their face and adjust the straps, um, which can lead to um, them you know, contaminating themselves potentially as well as we know the masks get dirty. Um, so if people, um, if people are wearing them and maybe they're uh, very and very early symptomatic uh, stage of COVID-19, it, it can help to keep their droplets in those respiratory droplets I talked about. Um, and we say it's a little bit equivalent to our recommendation that you sneeze or cough into your elbow. So it can help to contain your droplets and protect other people from you. Thank you. It's so hard not to touch your face. That's the hardest yeah. thing to learn. Yeah. So here's a question from Marion in Kamloops regarding access to primary care for non-COVID-19 related issues. The health minister is assuring us we can get medical help for non-COVID-19 related issues as there is a chronic doctor shortage in Kamloops. How do, these, how do those of us on a waiting list seek medical advice without risking a lineup at a clinic? How do people in the high risk category who are told it will be eight months to a year until they can get a doctor get ongoing medical care? 
Yeah, so in Kamloops, they have the urgent and primary care centre now. And then next to it, they have a learning centre that's got a number of residents uh, and supervised by a medical director. So if you need to uh, go to the urgent and primary care centre, you can call up and get an appointment. And a lot of uh, GPs are actually doing appointments virtually now as well. So um, certainly they will schedule an appointment and make sure you're not sitting congregated with other people. And if it is something that could be done virtually, they may um, be able to do that for you. And then of course, if it's something urgent, people should go to the emergency department if they need um, assistance on something more urgent. And there's uh, other ways, depending on uh, what the illness is. Uh, certainly, we don't want anybody sitting at home uh, in a, uh, a state where they really need assistance with mental health. If, the, if that's what the concern is, there is a, a crisis line for people, uh, 1-888-353-2273. It's always good for people to have that reminder just in case, um, you know, things get desperate for people if they're not getting access to their normal um, care providers. So um, certainly, uh, and then there's walk-in clinics that people could call up and see if there's if they're offering uh, virtual care as well. Thank you. We know that the province is taking uh, strong actions to prepare for the pandemic. Brian from Nelson asks, which hospitals are set up to receive COVID-19 patients in the South Kootenai region? And what is their acute care and ICU capacity? Uh, he goes on to say, uh, we hear that 19 hospitals are dedicated for intake in BC, but IHA puts no info on their website and releases no local press releases. It's important in smaller centers since both patients and family may have to be transported. Yeah. So out of those 19 hospitals, six of them are within Interior Health. So our two tertiary care sites, that's uh, Kelowna General Hospital, Royal Inland Hospital and Kamloops. And then there's four other hubs, which are um, East Kootenai Regional Hospital in Cranbrook, Kootenai Boundary Regional Hospital in Trail, uh, Penticton Regional Hospital and Vernon Jubilee. But however, if you're closer, if somebody did uh, deteriorate quickly, if they were at home and positive and needed to get quick access to care, uh, they, if they have a local hospital, uh, they are able to stabilize patients and provide immediate care. And then we would transfer that person uh, to one of the designated sites. Also for uh, people who are in more rural areas, we have been uh, in the process of setting up what we call uh, COVID communities, uh, sorry, community cohort centers. And those centers will be set up to bring somebody closer to a hospital if they've got quite a journey to drive over two hours to get to a hospital. It most likely will be like in a hotel setting and uh, there'll be resources available to that individual uh, to be safe and self-isolate. And the reason why we're doing that is because we do know this particular virus, people can deteriorate quite quickly. So we want them to be close to care where we could bring them into the hospital very quickly if that happens. Thank you. So um, the Premier and Minister Dix and, and Dr. Bonnie Henry had, had shared that the decision to cancel elective and, and non-urgent surgeries was one of the most difficult measures that they had to take uh, to prepare our hospitals during this, this epidemic. And this has had a profound impact on those who've been waiting for surgery. Both Tilio and Renee from Castlegar would like to know when elective surgeries are, are going to start again. And Doug in West Kelowna asks, can we get a clear explanation as to why we're not proceeding with elective surgeries here in the interior region when our COVID case numbers are quite low and steady and the hospitals seem to be underutilized? A lot of us are suffering continuing and worsening chronic pain. Yes, and I think for all of us that work in healthcare, we know how difficult that decision was. And um, a lot of people in pain uh, waiting on surgeries and uh, our heart goes out to those people and really empathize that um, people who have been getting closer now have a further delay. So um, the reason why we are not proceeding uh, forward now is uh, should we have a surge in uh, patients who do become positive? We need that capacity within the system to be able to care for them safely in hospital. We're sitting right now around 70% occupancy within our sites in, a, in across interior health. 
And um, so keeping that capacity right now, as Sue spoke about, to make sure that uh, that curve stays flattened and plateaued. So there are definitely discussions going on in the province around how one might ease back into uh, surgery and surgery in a very uh, phased approach so that we do not end up having that curve uh, swing up again. So lots of consideration there and there'll be lots of discussions happening around the best way to do that. But uh, we don't have a clear picture as of yet around exactly when that will be happening. Andrea in Summerland asks, the government and health authority has instructed citizens to stay home and walk in their neighborhoods. They have asked citizens to avoid any non-essential travel. Under these guidelines, why are golf courses allowed to stay open? Even if a participant, uh, participants follow the social distancing rules, doesn't it go against all the guidelines they have been asking citizens to follow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it is golf season out there. I'm not a golfer myself. But uh, I do understand we're, we're coming into that, and I'm sure there are a lot of eager people out there who want to golf. Um, my understanding from uh, correspondence I've received is that many golf courses have chosen to stay closed and not open, uh, but I'm aware that some are opening. And um, certainly the expectation of those golf courses that are staying open or choosing to open um, is that they follow, first off, the provincial uh, health officer orders around the closure of restaurants and uh, that, those types of food facilities. So those um, those facilities attached to golf courses would not be allowed to open and the golf course operators would be expected to ensure that all of the recommended guidelines are being followed for physical distancing um, and enhanced cleaning um, and uh, ensuring there's hand washing available and uh, and once again we would rely on those who are using the golf courses to do the same um, if they are out walking the course that they're maintaining their distancing and and uh, ideally, if they're with other people, it's just with the people that they live in the same household with. Um, and we, we at Interior Health, um, all of us do uh, appreciate uh, being outside and we recognize that the, there are many benefits and important benefits to us as humans to um, playing outside, uh, physical and mental. And uh, there are other ways to do that right now uh, that don't involve going to those types of, uh, those types of or doing those types of activities. Um, so in my neighborhood, I see a lot of people who are out walking with their kids or with their partners or their dogs um, and staying close to home, still getting their uh, physical activity and some exposure to nature, but doing it in a safe way. Thank you. Well, my dad's a 92-year-old avid golfer and is really looking forward to the course's opening and saying, we will do anything to ensure that we pr do proper social distancing and, and, and restaurants. We've talked to some of them in the region and they are, they're doing takeout. They're not opening. They're doing, they're providing, they're making sure. And, and there's so many restaurants that are providing that, that takeout service. It's been great. It's, you know, that they can still continue to stay open, which is really good. So, um, but people, of course, are thinking about summer and, and the fall, but uh, everybody, I think COVID-19 is weighing on everyone's minds. Uh, this one is from uh, Janine in, in Creston. And she says the Creston Valley consists of several communities from Yak to Ryandell, and they hold an, a country fall fair in mid-September um, in their local community center. This year will be their 102nd fall fair. They host about 2,600 people over two days to showcase and display the country and farming community, ending with a feast of local food and drink provided by our local farms. What are our chances of hosting this fair, even if we do 200 people intervals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so currently under the, um, the provincial public health order, um, that type of gathering would not be allowed. Um, right now it is around gatherings of uh, only less than 50 people, not over 50 people. And um, I have heard from our provincial health officer uh, this week um, that um, she's spoken to some events in the lower mainland like the PE, and um, they have since sort of canceled their, their plans. And I think that it's pretty safe to say that those types of uh, events will not be going forward over the next few months as we continue to work really hard um, to contain this virus um, and minimize the impact on our, on our on the public, but also on our healthcare system. And um, definitely that's a very sad thing for many people to hear. And those are events that people look forward to, especially if they've been going on for a hundred years. Um, but it's, again, these are temporary, these are temporary measures and we are making sacrifices right now. And 
um, the intent is that those will pay off for us down the road. Thank you. And a final little uh, question in advance, and we're going to move to the uh, live questions. And after this one is Robin from Kelowna asks, uh, it's important that the province of BC has taken the responsibility for overseeing the mandatory 14 day self-isolation period for migrant farm workers coming, coming back. However, once the 14 days are finished, they'll then move to the same overcrowding housing conditions that will not allow them to continue physically distancing. What is being done about farm worker housing on farms to protect workers? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's very accurate that uh, individuals arriving from outside of Canada um, to help support our agricultural industry are being uh, self-isolated uh, for 14 days, as is anybody returning into Canada at this point in time. Um, so there are some processes in place to make sure that when those individuals move to their uh, more permanent locations, first of all, that public health, local public health is being informed. Um, so we will, uh, we will know where those different individuals are. And through our teams, including our environmental health officers, um, we can work with those in those types of settings, with those farms, to help ensure that uh, the guidance is being followed in terms of um, appropriate uh, living condition, that there's uh, healthy food available for those individuals, um, but also around things like uh, cleaning and physical distancing. And so, again, the expectation is that those individuals will still need to be, and, and the people supporting them will still need to be following those public health measures. Thank you. And I get to ask the first live question. So from Cornelia, her question is, is it safe to clean for others in their homes? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, we know that uh, many, uh, many of those types of businesses have, uh, have closed down or scaled back. Um, and I think it really depends on, on the situation. And so we know that uh, for, for people, going, housekeepers going into other people's homes, um, there is, of course, a risk of either bringing COVID with you or uh, actually having COVID transmitted to you through somebody in the household. Um, there are, you know, it depends also on the clientele that you're serving. If you're serving, uh, if you're helping out individuals who are in that higher risk group who are elderly, right, there's going to be a higher risk there that, uh, that we don't want those people to, to um be infected with COVID and if you're going to multiple homes that's also a risk so there may be creative uh, ways to do that um, such as um, ensuring that when you're going in if you're going in to clean someone's home that they're not home at the same time um, they're using the proper properly recommended uh, cleaners and disinfectants um, and again I think it's really situational thank you thanks okay so I have the second live question from Camille um, as, uh, you think you can open restaurants, dine in soon, because servers touch the plates, dishes, and spoons used by guests. The same menus and the payment machines, there's the same washrooms. It's so tough for us because Dr. Henry said that she might open restaurants soon, but I feel that even if you do hundreds of changes, we are still prone to, still prone to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're not opening restaurants yet. Um, as you mentioned, there is still the the dine in or dine out and take out options, which uh, I think has helped those businesses to, to, you know, keep going for many of them. And I see lots of people um, who are able to supporting those restaurants and doing and, and uh, going with those options. So in terms of restaurants reopening, um, I think what's really important, and I think this is happening is that the restaurant industry um, is, you know, coming up with and, and uh, offering up creative solutions to the government in terms of what they think um, will work for them. Um, and how they can uh, follow that, continue to, continue to follow that public health guidance, uh, but, but open at the same time. Um, and as we're moving into warmer weather, we know there's patios, we also know the risk of COVID uh, transmission outside is, is certainly less than it is indoors. So there might be possibilities of, um, you know, spacing, certainly spacing tables out, uh, appropriate distance and minimizing the number of people that come into the restaurant and, uh, you know, enhance cleaning. So those are things that will, look to the restaurant industry to help um, provide some innovative and creative solutions on. Diesel would like to know, when can we expect the much needed scans such as MRI, CTs and ultrasounds to resume? I've been waiting for six weeks as of today and nothing heard yet. Yes, yeah, so um, diagnostics, ambulatory care, elective surgery are all uh, services impacted uh, by um, trying to decrease the activity and people in, in and out through the, the hospitals. But um, 
that will also be dependent on the urgency of the MRI or the scan based on the physician's recommendation. So if it is in fact emergent, it will be done. We're continuing on doing those types of uh, scans and MRIs. For uh, less urgent, of course, it, it's along with uh, elective surgery, those are still in abeyance. So that as soon as uh, we've given the green light to phase in uh, an approach to bringing those back online, we will do that as quickly as possible. Thank you. This is from Lori and I asked, what will the summer look like for youth centers and youth sports? Hmm. Right. Um, so there's a lot, another one, a lot of parents are interested in, in terms and children, right, in terms of getting together with some social interaction and some physical, physical activity. Um, so again, I don't think any decisions have been made yet around uh, youth sports or, or summer camps, um, what it might look like. We have, like I said, we have a ways to go. We need to, we need to determine how we're doing with the curve. Um, you know, ideally, we want to see not just a flattening, but a, a decrease in the curve that we're seeing fewer and fewer and fewer cases. Um, and uh, certainly we know that uh, these types of settings and environments are important, not just for kids, but also parents who, are try who might be trying to get back to work around that time as things start to uh, loosen up a little bit. Um, so again, this is an opportunity for uh, those who run summer camps or operate uh, summer camps or uh, coach uh, teams to think about some innovative and creative ways where um, maybe they could bring some of those activities back over the summer. Um, Melanie has a question, which is uh, coincidental to uh, Richard Zussman uh, Global News just putting out a tweet saying dentists and chiropractors are set to be some of the first professions to come out of the COVID lockdown. Melanie is an RMT in Kelowna and she says, I work at home in a separate clinic from my living space. Most of my clients are essential healthcare workers. I'd like to know when I'll be able to go back to work so I can help them stay physically healthy so they are able to care for all our people in the healthcare system. So mm -hmm. when... When, when are people going to go back and is there an, an order to this? Mm -hmm. So I've also seen that in the media a little bit in terms of uh, some, some maybe it's speculation, maybe it's more than mm -hmm. that in terms of which professions might go back first. And I also saw that about dentists and chiropractors. Right. And, um, and you're right, Norm, we do rely on uh, those individuals for our uh, health and well-being, including uh, registered massage therapists. Now, those, uh, those types of professions all ha are regulated under, under a college or association. Um, and there's been a lot of communication and correspondence between, between the province um, and those, uh, those uh, regulated um, professions and their uh, regulated bodies. Um, and, and we're very appreciative of um, how those uh, professions have responded to the COVID-19 outbreak. And we recognize that that's, it may be very difficult for them on an economic front. And so certainly those would be groups that would be great to see them be able to start to come back as we start to uh, ease up restrictions. Um, and I'm sure that they would have uh, many ideas in terms of how they could ensure they're maintaining, uh, maintaining the important measures um, and ensuring that they're practicing good infection prevention and control um, in their clinics and practices. So, yeah. So no hints to Melanie as to her, the thrust of her question is, when can she go back to work? Mm -hmm. so, right. Uh, no hints. May, so, June, July, August, September. Nothing. I I would defer to our provincial health officer on that mm -hmm. in terms of when that might be. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think all of us that use those services are out there waiting for that answer too. <laughs> so uh, Ramona uh, is asking, when will the serology tests be available, and how will people be prioritized to receive those tests? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Good question. So the serology test is, uh, is a blood test um, that allows us to determine if somebody has antibodies uh, to, to a disease, to a virus or bacteria. And so um, really interesting that uh, there is a, uh, certainly coming soon, will be a validated um, uh, antibody of serology test in BC. Um, and that will actually give us a good idea of, we hope, of um, how many people have actually had COVID-19 infection in our province and in our regions, and um, how many then um, have immunity to to this disease? And so um, we recognize that we have not we have we have not found all of the cases of COVID-19 over the past few months. Um, we have 156 lab confirmed cases in Interior Health, but we know there are other people who've had symptoms and oftentimes mild symptoms um, that was likely also COVID, um, but we don't pick them up in our daily uh, surveillance reporting. So that serology test is coming. 
uh, to BC. And it'll be really interesting um, to look uh, as a starting point at our healthcare workers, our healthcare workforce to see how many of the health workers potentially have immunity. Um, if we're able to determine how long that immunity lasts for COVID-19, those health care workers could get, could get back to work and have a little bit more confidence um, as they're working with patients with COVID-19. Thank you. Just as a follow-up, if they have if they prove uh, positive and have more confidence, can they work without the PPE or they still require the PPE? We would still require the PPE. Um, yeah. And again, we, we I think it's a little bit too early for us to know how long immunity uh, will last if you've been infected and how long you're immune for it. We were hoping mm -hmm. it would be for the, you know, the duration of the pandemic or maybe for at least a year or two, right. um, but we're still learning that. So we would okay. still be recommending the PPE. And there are also other, other um, infectious agents as well that we want, uh, we want people, the health workers to protect. Right. Well. Okay, thank you. Betty, um, Betty has, has several questions, so I'll try to go slow on this so we can capture all of them. She says that <clears throat> interior health, when is interior health going to start having workers in one site and not two, three or four sites? Are families aware that not everywhere is one site? Are you going to continue to have new residents brought into facilities and placed in quarantine? So two or three questions in there. Okay, so maybe the first one. Um, so uh, there was an order for single site for um, long-term care facilities, which is our most vulnerable population. And uh, we are allowed to phase that in where, and start where we think is most uh, prudent. So we have looked at um, some of our areas and are starting to look at uh, implementation in Kamloops and Cranbrook. And then we'll go from there as we, we learn, because obviously this impacts quite a lot of our employees. So um, we have to do this thoughtfully so that people have enough work and, and able to maintain their hours and, and their income. So we're starting doing that planning right now. And uh, we will move through other areas of the health authority as we've experienced what that um, has taught us in Kamloops and Cranbrook. And then uh, for, we do know as well in some of our, our long-term care facilities, that Interior Health doesn't have any contracts with, they're, they're privately owned. Some of them have gone ahead and implemented this already, so with their own staff, so that's quite positive. And uh, for introducing new residents into long-term care facilities, obviously um, movement throughout that uh, facility, uh, we're even trying to limit staff going from one area to another inside the facilities. So if there's a new client goes into that facility, obviously they would doing, trying to make sure they're fairly limited to who they're exposed to uh, until as you say that 14 days is over. Okay, thank you. And so this is from Mary. Uh, there are currently virus-free communities can we expect these communities to be infected or is there a good possibility they will remain virus free? So I think this comes back a little bit to people wanting to know where individuals are that uh, are positive. I think it's safe to assume this is a pandemic. This virus has uh, spread very fast across the world. Um, it's assume you have the virus where you live. Uh, that due diligence uh, that everybody's uh, demonstrating right now needs to continue. And I, I think it would give people a very false sense of security if they thought their community was not impacted by this. Raja says, what is the distance in the taxi? How safe the taxi drivers and taxi passengers? Mm -hmm. Right. So taxis are, uh, taxi drivers are still working and um, we recognize that's an essential service for many people to have access to that form of transportation. So there are ways I think to make it a safer ride for people. Um, so I would recommend that they sit uh, in, in the back seat uh, from the taxi driver. Um, some taxi companies uh, may be using uh, plastic shields um, or ways to um, prevent those droplets from moving back and forth between the, the front seat and the back seat. Um, and certainly if you are ill, uh, you shouldn't be getting in a taxi cab. Um, if you have any of those respiratory symptoms I mentioned earlier, you should be staying home and not getting in a cab because your droplets could be left on surfaces 
um, in the taxi. And we'd also expect that the taxi drivers are not working while they are ill or have respiratory symptoms. And then finally, I would say that, uh, again, the expectation would be that those taxis are cleaned um, on a regular basis and disinfected to ensure that we can they can um, get rid of any of those respiratory droplets that might be there with, with virus. So Sean is asking, I have an MRI booked for May 5th. Is this still going to take place? And if so, do I have to wear a mask in the hospital? So uh, again, if I not knowing um, if this is an emergent uh, procedure or if it's one that can wait, and um, that would be dictated by their healthcare provider. So if it is deemed emergent, it will continue. If it's um, something that can be postponed until a later date, then uh, it probably will be. Uh, as soon as we are given, as I've said, the green light to start phasing into uh, bringing people on, we will make sure that, um, that the, the wait list that we have is maintained so people don't lose their spot, if you like, and make sure that people are brought in the right order. And if anybody's condition has changed while they've been waiting uh, on their MRI or CT and they feel that they're deteriorating, they should get in touch with their primary care provider and they could do a, a virtual visit with them uh, or whatever they need to make sure that they're not at the point that they need something else. So will someone call them then to tell them that the... Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Cool. Linda asks, uh, if you live alone and have been self-isolating, is it okay to get together with another person who also lives alone and has been self-isolating? Hmm. Hmm. Well, we have heard of, um, of some um, solutions to the self-isolation issues. So um, in in including, I've heard of families who um, kind of dedicate themselves to each other and they uh, promise that they won't have contact with anybody else, but they wanna get together, just those two families and have the kids play together. Um, so recognizing the importance of, of the social connection and for people who are uh, people who are living alone that they might need that. Um, I think that's something that they could certainly explore doing, um, but they need to be sure that they weren't uh, they weren't uh, social uh, they weren't uh, socially congregating with other people. Um, and I'd still recommend that they maintain their um, six uh, feet or two meter distance uh, if they were together, and that they are washing their hands and following all those good practices and not getting together if they're ill or have respiratory symptoms. I think you just made a lot of people very happy with that answer. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> I think so too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Wilf asked, could this virus disappear just like the SAR virus did a few years back? Mm -hmm. Right, so we had SARS in, uh, in 2003. Um, it's also a coronavirus and it had a, uh, worse uh, sort of case fatality rate than this COVID-19, so a bit more severe um, in terms of the number of, of deaths that we saw. Um, and, it, and it did go away. We, it, we did see some, some outbreaks of it and it was contained, um, certainly. And um, I'm not sure we're gonna see that with, with COVID-19. I think a lot of really strong efforts were made at the beginning to try and, and we heard about containing, containing, containing this virus. And um, unfortunately we saw it spread uh, globally um, and it's also, it, it spreads relatively easy between people as well. Um, so I think it's going to be around with us for quite a long time and certainly until we have a vaccine um, available to us. Uh, Kitsman wants to know how many COVID-19 tests are being done per day in British Columbia? And maybe you can also introduce the new tool that's available uh, online for people to see uh, the, the data that's coming out every day. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can speak to I can speak to our interior health situation for testing, and so we do actually have uh, we have four labs now that do testing um, in in the interior health region. And I think Susan mentioned earlier that we have done over uh, we've done over nine thousand tests over the course of the pandemic for our interior health residents, and six thousand of those have been um, have been done through our interior health lab. So that's quite a feat and it's really um, led us to uh, have a relatively rapid turnaround time of test results. So at the very beginning of this uh, pandemic, we um, we saw maybe a few days to get a test result back because our lab, our, our uh, nasopharyngeal swabs had to be sent to Vancouver to BC CDC for, for uh, testing. And, and now we're getting a turnaround time that's much quicker. 
Um, so we are doing a lot of testing in interior health and we know with our uh, increased or expanded testing criteria provincially uh, that's come out this week, we're likely to see more testing as well. Um, and that's a good thing because we want to know where this virus is and we want to be able to contain it. So to answer the second part, the uh, BC Centre for Disease Control has a new link. If people would just uh, go to the website, they'll see the link to a tool that actually gives them the daily breakdown of all the people that have been tested, those that have, are in ICU, those are in hospital, et cetera. It's really a, a great tool, just uh, BC Centre for Disease Control. Over to you, Katrine. Okay, thanks, Nor. So Crystal is asking, uh, seasonal allergies versus COVID-19 symptoms. Mm -hmm. Okay, good one. So uh, not everybody has seasonal allergies. Uh, those people who do probably are, uh, it's probably not the first time they've had them and they're probably aware of what those symptoms um, are and how they present. Um, so certainly if these are symptoms that you've not had before that are new um, and that meet some of those uh, symptoms that I talked about earlier um, that are consistent with COVID, I'd really recommend um, having a very low threshold for um, having it for reaching out to your healthcare provider or to one of our um, IH COVID uh, assessment and testing centers to inquire about getting a test. And, um, and certainly people can do the BCCDC uh, COVID self-assessment tool um, as well online. And I just did it today actually to try it out and uh, it works quite well. And it'll actually guide you through uh, a series of questions. And at the end, it'll let you know uh, what you should do in terms of getting a test or um, seeking further advice, or in some cases, people who maybe have more severe symptoms they weren't aware of um, to reach out um, to get some more urgent care. So we only have uh, four minutes left. So I'm going to wrap this up uh, with the last question. And uh, I could give you a whole number of questions, but I'll, I'll make, I won't do that. I'll just ask the question about questions. Uh, when we did this before, I forget, it's been what, two, three, four weeks, probably three weeks ago when we did the first one, Susan and Sue. Um, at the end of it, you committed to uh, those that didn't get their questions answered that uh, you would get the questions and try over the next few days to provide answers to on your website. And you did a great job. You know, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the quick turnaround. So there's the question. All those people that have submitted questions, uh, if we give you those questions, do you think you can do that again? Absolutely. I think um, we might not do them individually, but certainly where there's themes, we'll do our best to get a response out there. For awesome. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Katrine. Okay, well, I, just, I want to say thank you too. Thank you, Susan and Sue, for your, I mean, the, the valuable information you shared tonight and how well you've answered the questions. I, I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody watching tonight did too. You guys are, you're both amazing. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing for us and the Interior Health Authority. And, and I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, especially our guests. And, and I want to thank my co-host, Norm, for the great job you've done too. Um, and I want to thank uh, Health Minister Adrian Dix and Dr. Bonner Henry for the work that they're doing. Um, our government has taken action and, and continues to work hard to support British Columbians. And, and they are leading the charge on it and, and have done such an amazing job. So uh, kudos to them. And before we wrap up, we want to leave you with a few additional resources. And so Norm, I'm going to let you begin. So for provincial support uh, and COVID-19 information, please visit uh, www.gov.bc.ca slash COVID-19. For seniors looking for additional support at this time, call 211 or visit www.bc211.ca. That's 211 or www.bc211.ca. If you or a family member need additional medical advice, please call 811. And for the latest medical updates, including case counts, prevention, risks, and testing, visit www.bccdc.ca. Uh, for the provincial health officer's orders, notices, and guidance, you can visit www.gov.bc.ca backslash PHO guidance. For non-health related information, including financial, childcare and education supports, travel, transportation and essential service information, you can go to the uh, gov.bc.ca backslash COVID-19 website or call 1-888-COVID-19, which is 1-888-268-4319 between 7.30 in the morning and eight at night, seven days a week and people will have answers for you. 
And remember, please follow public health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry's guidelines so that we can all help protect our families and friends, our neighbors and ourselves and those we haven't met yet. These uh, very basic measures continue to be the most important. So those basic measure, measures are stay at home when you're sick, wash our hands frequently for 20 seconds. I think we said it was uh, the ABCs or happy birthday. My grandson says it's ABCs twice, Granny. So I got my I got schooled. Um, cover our cough and, and sneeze with our elbow. And don't forget, even though we're apart, to try to stay connected, find ways to stay connected. And as Dr. Henry says, be kind, be kind to each other, be kind on social media, just wherever you can. And, and I want to thank you all again for joining us. And I hope you all have a really good evening. Good night. Stay safe. Good night.